please remain standing to prepare to give our tithes and offerings. You guys can go ahead and have a, ahead and have a seat. I have a missions minute update from Brother Gallo. It's actually quite long, so I'm going to break this one up into a couple of, couple of evenings. You might remember they had a pretty devastating cyclone several months ago, and he kind of talks about that on the first page. He quotes Proverbs 25, 25, As cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Our last newsletter was a long while back, and many events and awesome happenings have delayed the writing of this newsletter. Truly, we have enjoyed God's awesome blessings as we have seen them here in Lighthouse Baptist Church. With the devastating cyclone Winston back in February, the school calendar and many church activities were put on hold. Although many Fijians were devastated and greatly discouraged, God in his amazing love opened up the hearts of many citizens in the country and also abroad, so that those who fell victim to the storm were able to receive some aid and other basic necessities. This also gave us the opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to them and to give them gospel tracts as well. The Lord allows trials and testings to come about in our lives so that we may appreciate the very things that he blesses us with. Even the unforeseen storms and natural disasters are things beyond our control, and human understanding require us only to trust in God to see us through and also strengthen our faith in him all the more. Cyclone Xena, a smaller version than the tropical storm Winston, hit the shores of Fiji on the 6th of April. It was basically heavy rainfall and strong winds, but nothing as scary as the previous storm. But sadly, due to the scare of Tropical Storm Winston, most of the communities in and around us had no electricity for safety purposes. There were only business houses and mainly shopping centers that ran on backup generators that provided the basic necessities for the locals. Although electricity came back to us, it was given sparingly and only at certain times of the day and or the evening so that our little church-run school had to adjust to the changes and adapt to the different weather conditions. During this time, it brought not only the community together, but also the church members, and we were glad to see that everyone was okay and there was not any major damage caused by the second storm. So although we, uh, we're pretty used to having electricity anytime we need it, and it's not running on generator power, and uh, we don't have to adjust our schedule based on when the power is on, uh, let's continue to remember to pray for the Gallows. And uh, I think they're mostly through the storm season now. Uh, they do have... Uh, a request. He says, I have a very urgent need. We have seen uh, land for a church that the landowner is willing to give us for $20,000. Normally the land in Nadi will be around $100,000 in this area. It has been years that we've been praying for the church land and this would be a great time to purchase this property. If you can partner with us to raise this $20,000, it will be a blessing. It is one acre of land and about 25 minutes drive from the airport. So far, $2,500 have been collected uh, toward helping out in this worthy mission. Again, thank you for everything that you have done for this ministry. We thank God for the Gallos and their ability to uh, reach to the, all of the islands in and around Fiji and for this opportunity that they have to have a permanent facility for their church and school. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the facilities that we have here, Lord. We thank you for uh, protection from the elements. Lord, we want to remember our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world that um, don't have the same kind of facilities, but we thank you, Lord, that they continue to praise your name and to serve you and to look for ways to uh, reach out and share the gospel even through uh, troubled times like through Cyclone Winston. We thank you for the Gallows and their testimony. Lord, we pray that you would continue to give them uh, strength and endurance and Lord, for this need that they have, for this opportunity uh, to purchase land for a church building, we pray that that need would be met. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us to give toward missions, to projects like this, and also toward our own outreach here in Sonoma County. Lord, I pray that you would uh, bless each giver, Lord, and help us to remember to be faithful with our tithes and generous with our offerings. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, are we on, Tricia? All right. Well, I, first of all, I wanted to say what a surprise it was, what a, how great it was tonight when uh, I saw Brother Snodderly come walking through that door. And, and for those of you that, uh, that don't know Brother Snodderly, uh, we have New Hope Baptist Church has a special relationship, a special love for this man and his family. Um, not only has, has he been a friend of New Hope Baptist Church for many years, but here, was it a couple of years ago? Probably was, uh, when our pastor was, uh, was uh, not well, Brother Snodderly was here. To, uh, par par pardon me? 2011. 2011? How did that happen? <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Well, you're older than I thought then, so. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to uh, talk to you tonight about... Uh, about creation evolution. Uh, you know, I, I have the class, the CSI class. Or where, uh, how many of my class members are here? Raise your hand. Class of one, two, three, three, three. Where's the rest of them? Belva, where's your husband? I told him he had to be here. Uh, okay, all right. So, uh, but, uh, so, you know, last night I went to a baseball game. Um, and, and so, so did David Scott and Jenna went to and 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 the, in the highlight show after the biggest highlight was uh, was Jenna on TV. So that was that was uh, that was that was pretty good. But I went with my went with my grandson, and we had uh, crab sandwiches. And, and but I was still hungry, so I said, "Go get me some nachos." And so he went up and got some nachos, and he came back with this thing that was about this big. And I mean, it was filled with steak and guacamole and, and, and sour cream and chips. And I mean, not just a little bit. It wasn't, it wasn't like, I mean, this was huge. So I, I decided I was going to eat the whole thing. And I was thinking, I was thinking as I was doing this, that if evolution was true, all of my kids would be born with one of these, you know, because I would pass it along to them, correct? Uh, no, nah, not going to happen. So, um, how many of you have heard this before? Creation science is a contradiction in terms, or the concept of creation is religious, not scientific. We get that a lot. Um, in reality, this could be better applied to the term evolution science, because I, I looked up the word in the dictionary. The definition of religion, something one believes in and follows devotedly. And those of you that have gone to secular schools, you know how devotedly teachers will preach, because that's what they're doing in the classroom, evolution. But real science is based on observation and experimentation, and no one has ever observed true evolution taking place anywhere. It is so hard to believe that the order of life on earth and in the universe came about from complete disorder. All you have to do is look at it, and it tells you. We're going to talk about the evidences for creation, but first let's talk about the evidence against evolution. Evolution is presented as fact in grade schools, in high schools, in college, in the news, in movies, and Preston, even in video games. Evolution is presented as fact. Now, in, in our class, we do homework every week, and the homework is to look, at, look in the media, look on whatever you see in the news, and let's, let's see where it's promoted, and let's talk about it in class. And let's look at the holes in it. So that homework assignment goes for all of you for all time. Let's watch it, because you'll see it. Um, so what a notable, it, it, they talk about, it is taught as fact. But what do the notable evolutionary scientists really say about evolution when they're not out there promoting it. Let's take a look at some of these. Um, some of these statements here. Uh, 
evolution, at least in the sense that Darwin speaks of it, cannot be detected within the lifetime of a single observer. That was David Kitts. I won't go into the history of these, or the, the background of these scientists, but, but even he admits that you can't see evolution. You can't see it anywhere. Um, and now Darwin <coughs> supposedly solved the problem of how species came about in his book of origin, the book on the origin of species. But Niles Eldridge made this statement. Darwin never really did discuss the origin of species in his book on the origin of species. Because he couldn't. He couldn't because there's no information there. I mean, there's uh, what some people will call microevolution, which is really adaptation. Dogs are still dogs. They don't change into, into cats, or, and there's no scat in between. Colin Patterson said, no one has ever produced a species by mechanisms of natural selection. No one has gotten near it. You cannot go from one species to another. There is no evidence of it. There's no known mechanism that produces the evolutionary steps. One scientist, Keith S. Thompson, said, evolution is troubled from within. Now remember, these are evolutionary scientists. This isn't Answers in Genesis or creation.com uh, uh, or, or anything. These are evolutionary scientists making these statements. Evolution is troubled from within by the troubling complexities of genetic and developmental mechanisms and new questions about the central mystery. Speciation itself. For one species to change into another species, you need to add information. And as we've talked about many times before, the laws of information, our information cannot create itself. Information has to come from an intelligent source. Those are the laws of information. For one species to change to another species, it needs the information of that species. It can't happen. In all this time since Darwin, you'd expect some evidence on how new species came about. Evolutionary scientists claim that the fossil record is the best evidence for evolution. But in the billions of fossils that have been found all over the world since Darwin, they have not found one true transitional fossil with transitional structures or transitional uh, features. They haven't found it. It is not there. Stephen M. Stanley said, the known fossil record fails to document a single example of the phyletic evolution accomplishing a major morphologic transition. It's not there. There is no evidence for evolution. Another author said, uh, this is Tom Kemp, he says, as it is well known, most fossil species appear instantaneously in the fossil record. persist for some time, virtually unchanged, only to disappear abruptly. Again, things they see in the fossil record do not change. One thing does not change into another. DJ Fut see, Futi Yuma said creation and evolution between them exhaust the possible explanations for the origin of living things. Organisms either appeared on, a f on the earth fully developed or they did not. If they did not, they must have developed from a pre-existing species of, by some process of modification. If they did appear in a fully developed state, they must have been created by some omnipotent intelligence. This is an evolutionist speaking. What he said right there, they must have appeared fully developed or not. It's one or the other. It either came fully formed or they evolved from something. But we just saw that there's no mechanism for them to evolve. 
in any way. We apply logic to it. There's no known process for them to evolve, so that rules that out. So it must be, if they did appear in a fully developed state, they must have been created by some omnipotent intelligence. We can't prove creation any more than the uh, evolutionists can prove evolution, but we can apply logic to the observation and experimentation of science. And the logic applies to these uh, evolutionary scientists. The, the logic applied to these evolutionary scientists exposes holes in the evolutionary theories. I want to show you, uh, we're going to apply a logic here. We're, we're going to watch a short little video clip uh, so you can see what, what we're talking about when we talk about logic. Science has proven evolution, therefore evolution is true. Since evolution is true and Christians don't believe it, then Christians don't believe science and they aren't rational people. Really. Let's put that claim to the test. First off, evolution in the sense that things change is evident. No rational person disputes that. Therefore, rational Christians believe it. We can observe change. But evolution in the sense that life came from non-life and then that life began to randomly generate new genetic information and over time it eventually produced humans is something entirely different and something that quite honestly doesn't hold up against science. In other words, evolution in the sense of molecules to man is not scientifically plausible and therefore should not be viewed as scientific fact. Quite honestly, it is in great opposition to science, that is, observational science, the kind of science we can test and repeat and use our five senses to understand. Science demonstrates that over time, living organisms lose genetic information. They don't gain it. That same science demonstrates that life doesn't arise from non-life. Hey, follow along if you would. Fact one, there is no known observable process by which new genetic information can be added to an organism's genetic code. None. That pretty much refutes evolution right away because there's no way to go from a fish to an amphibian without adding new information, right? If living organisms cannot produce new genetic information, how can anything gradually change into something of higher intelligence or form or complexity? That is, how can anything evolve from an amoeba to a man without adding new genetic information? The answer, of course, is that it can't. Plain and simple. Now, some have speculated and they have imagined all kinds of things and they brought in artists to produce creative renderings based on guesses and they have been successful in telling a very convincing story that humans evolved from ape-like creatures. But those are just drawings, people. They're just stories. But what we really observe is humans are humans and apes are apes. Now, if fact one buried evolutionary thinking deep into the Precambrian soil, this next fact, fact two, tosses so much sediment on it that not even the greatest team of paleontologists with the latest subterranean gizmo could dig up the remains. Check this out. Never, again, never has it been observed that life can come from non-life. So here are two major scientific evidences against evolution. I reiterate for clarity, life has never been observed to come from non-life, and there is no known observable process by which new genetic information can be added to the genetic code of an organism. So molecules to man evolution doesn't really make scientific sense. Yet we are all here, and life is all around us in various forms. Although evolution cannot account for this, the Bible can. The Bible reveals that the all-powerful, all-knowing, supernatural God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing, and all life according to its kinds, that is, each with its own set of genetic information. So, again, what the Bible reveals makes sense of what we see and understand. Evolution does not. Enough said. Enough said. We've talked about information before in here, and, and, and I've given you um, a, a pretty, pretty uh, long, drawn-out explanation of what information is and what code is and so on and so forth. Remember, that can't create itself. Um, so, so we're going to apply logic to what we see. If you found a rock, and let's say it was in the shape of a car, and then you found another rock that had been carved into an arrowhead, you could tell that one had a designer. You could tell that one was one happened by natural process. Well, that, that's what we can apply that to science. Um, and this is what we find in nature. So, so we're going to look at a, a, a few things here. And some of these we've talked about in our creation class, and some of them we spent whole classes on them. <clears throat> I'm, I'm just going to, we're just going to touch on each one of these topics. We've spent whole classes, or, or sometimes, because those of you in our class know that we kind of go off on tangents sometimes when we, when we start looking at things. Um, but... Uh, we're just we're just gonna we're just gonna touch on them. Um, 
I, I'll show you one. That I, I actually took this out on the golf course and showed it to a couple of guys I play golf with. Trish, you want to put that first slide up? So anybody, uh, some of my class members might know what this is, but uh, does it, anybody, anybody know what this is that's not in my class that hasn't seen this before? Well, I showed it to some golfers. You know what it is, Tim? A spaceship. It's designed like a spaceship. Yeah. I, I, I like that. Nobody said that. Um, it... it, it uh, It actually has rotors, it has seals, and it spins. Um, it, it's, a, it's a motor, is what it is. And it's a, uh, it, it's a well-designed motor, has a real good function. And do you know where it's found? It's right, there's, there's a lot of them right here in this room. This, this motor is found in your body. You have millions of them in your body. This is what's called a, a bacterial flagellum. You want to show me the next slide, Tricia? That motor actually drives uh, bacteria through, through your body, the bacterial flagellum. It has a, it has a function. And this is a this is a perfectly designed mechanism that has rotors. It, it, has, it, it, it provides its own power. Evolutionists won't touch this. And when I tell people this, like on the golf course, I did, I did it last week just, just so I could talk about it in, in here, what the response was. The guys I showed it to thought I was crazy. But it's a great way to to share the gospel with people. Uh, thank you, Tricia. That could not have evolved. The evolutionary process that it would take, you, 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 you couldn't even begin to attempt to come up with an evolutionary path for a motor. You know, you'd need the rings in there. You'd need the, the uh, you, you just can't go there. Um, we'll go on to another topic. DNA. We talk about the laws of information. We talk about the definition of information. The D DNA that is within you has enough information in it to fill this room with encyclopedias. That DNA did not write itself. Evolutionists won't touch this. Information can only come from an intelligent source. Information cannot write itself. We spent a lot of time in the class on that. You know, and, 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 we're going we're gonna to jump to a lot of things, but I was reading something today. Did you know that hornets, those little nasty little things that fly around, and you've got to smack them and, and, uh, and step on them and, and so they won't sting you? Did, did you know that they actually have in their skin little solar powered units they convert the sun into energy now I want to know which hornet came up with that first and how he passed it on to his buddies you know um, which brings up the bombardier beetle I know a lot of you know about the bombardier beetle the bombardier beetle takes two chemicals and mixes it inside <coughs> its body it has a, 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 a pouch, a container, it mixes those, and then it fires them out at its predators at, at uh, 200, over 200 degrees. And those two chemicals, now, now I really want to see the bombardier beetles that failed as they were trying to evolve this. How do I mix this chemical, and what's it going to do to me? I mean, there are dead beetles all over the place. Um, same goes for scorpions and, and, and snakes, the venom that they have. How There's no evolutionary process for them to develop that and then have a method of getting their predators with it. There's, there's no steps. We've all talked about the laws of thermodynamics. 
things do not get better, they break down. If you take, uh, oh, we had a bag of oranges on the table that we got at Costco. <laughs> My wife decided she didn't like the oranges, so I was going to take them back to Costco, and I forgot about them. The second law of thermodynamics dynamics set in, and if I took them into Costco right now, I'd be, uh, <clears throat> I'd be, well, they'd have to spray me probably. Um, we talked about the 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 pol uh, polonium rings in granite. That uh, that, according to evolutionists, that took this this planet millions of years to cool, and that's why. There's granite, and the granite cooled at a slow rate. However, the rings of the, of the polonium, uh, which only lasts a few seconds, prove and show that the granite was hardened almost instantaneously, like maybe on day one. Um, let's talk about Darwin's finches. Now, Darwin, oh, we knock him a lot. Darwin was actually a good scientist. In, in, in observational science, because that's what he did. He, he observed finches and saw differences in finches and even drew pictures of them, but they were still finches. The information for the finch to adapt to whatever food or surrounding it was in, the information was in the finch at the beginning. He observed this and then extrapolated it out and decided, well, that must mean one species can turn into another species if a finch can change its beak. But that information for it to change into something else is not there. Archaeopteryx, uh, how many have heard that? That was a bird that they said was the, the, the missing link of between dinosaurs and birds. And so, turns out that, that was just an extinct bird with, that had claws. The peppered moth, that is something evolutionists use like crazy. They talk about, okay, the peppered moth, it's dark on this tree, and then when it gets on a other tree, when, when, when uh, actually it was light on one tree, it was a light color, and when, it, when the trees got covered with soot, they landed on that, and then the, the, the moths changed. The next population of moths changed to a, a darker color. But they were still moths. They weren't something different. They had the information inside of them, the information in their DNA, to change color when they needed to. Um, it, it, that's the same thing with dogs. You know, dogs are still dogs are still dogs. Cats are cats are cats. The Bible tells us God created them after their own kind. Oh, the fossil record. You heard in that one statement that, that the, uh, um, sci the scientists, evolutionary scientists, say the fossil record is the best, uh, the best source for information on on, uh, on uh, evolution. Well, let's look at the Cambrian explosion. That's what the guy said. They appear ab abruptly. They can't figure that out. In the, in the Cambrian explosion, all of a sudden, all these species were there. There's nothing that shows that they evolved from something else. The, in the human fossil record, humans are humans are humans are humans. And, and there's been some discoveries Every now and then you read in the paper, the missing link has been found. Uh, like, like the Neanderthals, at one time, that was the missing link. They're humans. Audie, was, was that you? You put that on, on Facebook today, that, that picture? Okay, Audie uh, and Christina both put a, a picture on Facebook of this man. He could have been a Neanderthal. He was a boxer. And the man was, I don't know, how tall was he? He was seven-something. He was huge. And he had the ugliest face you ever saw in your life. And not from fighting. That was just him. And, uh, and it, it, but if he had been found, the evolutionists would have said, hey, this is, uh, 
He was a man. Neanderthals were a man. They had the, uh, the Piltdown Man. Well, the Piltdown Man turned out to be just a man that somebody, some evolutionary scientist, decided to file down the jaw a little bit so it would look a little different. And it was a, it was a complete hoax. But he had the whole world thinking, there's the missing link. That proves that we evolved from apes. Nebraska man was another one. And then when we got a little more advanced in our technology, we found out that they came up with that whole Nebraska man from a pig's tooth. And then Lucy, I mean, Lucy, that, that okay, Lucy, uh, A. afarensis. You saw in there, the, in, in that video, they talk about they hire artists. I don't know if you've seen some of the drawings of Lucy. Those of you that are in school have probably seen them. But they, they, they have a few skull bones, a few rib bones, a couple arm bones, a, I think like one or two little tiny finger bones, and they have a knee bone. That, that's what they have. But in the drawings, they give Lucy human features and have Lucy gazing off into the sunset. And, and in museums, they've given Lucy human hands and feet. Turns out that the bones that they actually have are that of a chimpanzee, an extinct chimpanzee. The knee bone w was actually found uh, two and a half miles away from the rest of it, but they put it with that because they thought eh, that, that, that would work. Uh, the only fossil footprints that walk like human beings are human. There's been, been nothing else that walks like us. Um, and then we can get on to the Grand Canyon, Mount St. Helens. Uh, the, the Grand Canyon, they said, took, you know, millions of years. How many have been to the Grand Canyon? And see that little, isn't that amazing, the Grand Canyon? That's incredible. You could just stop here and think about the size of the Grand Canyon. But they, evolutionists say that that little river over millions of years created the Grand Canyon. Well, that was all put to rest when Mount St. Helens blew back in the 80s. Because in four hours, a miniature, and not so miniature, miniature Grand Canyon was, was formed. And so let's see, was there a time when there was a lot of water moving on this planet? Hmm. <laughs> That's all it took. I don't think the Grand Canyon was created in four hours when the water was draining off. It might have taken a little longer than that, but, but, the, and, and then the rock layers. There is a video that I keep threatening to show our class on geology that is a real snoozer, and it talks about the sorting of rocks and pebbles, and, and under under extreme water pressure as it goes through. Guess what it does? It takes those and it layers them. You know, not a layer every year, not a layer over 10 years or a season. Instantaneously, those layers that you see with massive movements of water can happen like that, as what happened in Mount St. Helens. If you ever see some of the pictures, you'll see the layers in there. They were created in four hours. Oh, we could go oh, to Spirit Lake at Mount St. Helens. Uh, there are some, uh, some parks that have, that have shown fossilized trunks that, that uh, s st stick in the, in the ground. And they say, this is one layer, this is another layer, this is another layer. But at Mount St. Helens, that happened at Spirit Lake. They found that the, some of the logs were heavier than others, and they... Some of them sunk to different depths. So it blew that theory. We talked about Einstein's theory of relativity in our, in our class and, and time. And uh, that's a whole other thing we can go on for. How long did we spend on that, Randy, talking about time in our class? Weeks. A long Weeks. time. A long time. A long time. A long time. <laughs> However, a long time here or a long time billions of miles away? Um, the list goes on and on, and, 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 I, and, and, and I could give you all kinds of things. But I've got a little short little clip here from Ken Ham that I thought we'd take a look at, and it might, uh, might help you with, with this topic.
what's the best proof of creation? The very first verse of the Bible states, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Of course, if that verse is not true, then neither is the rest of the Bible true. People then ask, well, how do you know that there's a creator? How do you know that God created the heavens and the earth? What is the ultimate proof of creation? Well, in one sense, scientifically, empirically, you can't prove or disprove that there's a creator. You can't prove or disprove the Bible because we're finite beings. We haven't always been there. We don't know everything. But if there really is a creator, we'd expect to see evidence of the creation, the evidence that there's intelligence behind the universe, and we do. We find that evidence in living things. Even when we look at the basic building block of life, DNA, we see there that there's a code system and an information system, all evidence that there is a designer and intelligence behind life. And of course, if there is a great designer, a great creator behind the universe, the only way we would ultimately know who he is is if he revealed himself to us. Actually, the Bible tells us that he revealed himself to us in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus, who stepped into history to be the God-man, to die on a cross, be raised from the dead, and offer a free gift of salvation. And he reveals himself to us in the word of God, the written word. The Bible is a very unique book. It claims to be the word of God who knows everything, who's always been there, who has revealed himself to us through the written word that he breathed into meant his spirit to ensure that we have an inerrant, infallible word from our Creator. And you know, if the Bible really is God's Word, we'd expect to find evidence consistent with what we read in the Bible, and we do. The fact that the Bible tells us God made kinds of animals and plants after their kind is consistent with what we see in biology, that there are distinct groups or kinds, like the dog kind, that doesn't change into a different kind, even though you can have variation within a kind. The Bible tells us that we're all descendants of one man and one woman. Actually, the science of genetics confirms that there's only one human race. And the Bible tells us there's been a global flood. We see billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And that tells us that there really has been a global flood, although we can't ultimately scientifically prove it. But is there an ultimate proof of creation? Well, there is an ultimate proof in this sense that if there is no creator, no creator God, and if the Bible is not true, then nothing makes sense. We all agree on the laws of logic, that we can argue with each other, talk with each other, and that we can use logic to reason with each other. We all agree on the laws of nature, that there are laws that govern the universe that were the same yesterday and today and will be tomorrow, which is why we can experiment uh, with what we have around us and we can build our technology. But why do we have the laws of logic? Why do we have the laws of nature? If it was a random universe, if there's no creator God, no absolute authority, no infinite creator behind the universe. How do we know that those laws won't change tomorrow? How do we know that someone else's logic is not the same as ours? How do we know for sure that we can logically argue with each other? You see, the only thing that makes sense is if there is a creator God, as the Bible tells us. People who argue with each other, even to talk to each other, or accept the laws of nature so we can then experiment in this world, have to actually borrow from presuppositions. When you think about it, the ultimate proof of creation is the fact that this universe exists, is governed by laws that God established, laws that we all understand and recognize and we all agree upon. So to answer the question, or to ask the question, what is creation science? Those who, those who profess evolution in their science have a bias presupposition, like Ken Ham just talked about, that of there is no God or possible supernatural explanation for the existence of anything, matter or life. Now creation scientists, on the other hand, also have a bias, a presupposition that this book is true, cover to cover, beginning to end, Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, from the word in to the word amen. Genesis 2 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. They were finished. There's no room in there for ev evolution. It was done. Hebrews 11 says, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God 
so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. In other words, nothing came from something else. It all came from the words, let there be. Now both the evolutionists and the creationists have the same scientific evidence to review. Science is science. It's the interpretation of those observations that sets the scientists apart. Now, if you, if you have a bias or a presupposition that aliens planted us on this planet or that we're not really here and we're the imagination of some single-celled amoeba, amoeba, then I'm sure your interpretation of the science would be a little bit different. But what we've shown here is that if you apply, apply logic, it really only points in one direction. And for that matter, and for that matter, like Ken Hansen, what what is logic? Where did it come from? If everything derived from pure matter, as evolution evolutionists believe, how did logic come about? From a rock? Where, where did that come from? Where where did love come from? Hate, humor, or curiosity? Curiosity even to do the science. Where did that come from? The rock didn't come up with curiosity to study the rock. Uh, there we go. Applying logic to everything again. Uh, um, when you consider all of the things we talked about, the complexity, information, feelings, obvious purpose, design, and so many things, there's only one thing that could have authored this existence. An omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent God, the God of the Bible, no other religion or self-proclaimed deity can come close to the capabilities of doing what was done, doing what the God of the Bible did. The God of our salvation. He knows all, he created all, he tells us he sent his son to die for us. He's omnipotent, so he can do that. He knows we're all sinners in need of a savior, so he's taken care of that for us. He's omniscient and he's omnipotent, so he can do that. So what is creation science? It's the only true logical science. You know, why is this important? Some people might say, well, well, well God used evolution. But as Ken Ham said, God has revealed himself to us in the word of God. Nowhere in here does it say we evolved, but it does say created. Yeah, he could have done it any way he wanted, but he told us in his word he created. Would he lie to us in the word of God? I mean, we agreed earlier in this that we believe this cover to cover. Why would we... Why, why would we tear out pages of it and, and, and apply evolution to it? Um, 1 Timothy 6, 20 and 21 says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. Verse 21 goes on and says, when some professing have erred concerning the faith. There, there are preachers in this country that will preach this word and say it's okay to believe in evolution. Satan loves that. Satan uses things like God used evolution or our education system to deceive and misdirect us. Just like just like the serpent did. One of the times I was up here, I don't know if I showed you the clip, but I told you about the clip. It was from Nova, uh, a, a TV special. And this was also repeated. I, I, had, uh, I actually had a recording of a teacher using this in a class. And the teacher said to the class, forget Jesus. A planet exploded to give you life. A planet died for you. 
Satan loves that. And if he can get you to doubt any portion of the Bible, he can get you to doubt the entire Bible. He can get you to doubt the, the virgin birth, the sinless life of Christ, the death on the cross, the resurrection. And he can get you to doubt your salvation. What is creation science? It's logical interpretation of scientific facts. But more importantly, why is it important? I'll tell you why it's important. Because your salvation and the salvation of people that are swayed by evolutionary, evolutionary lies is at stake. There are so many people out there, especially young people, that have gone through secular schools that don't even want to listen to this because they have been told that evolution is true so you can throw this book out because a planet died for you. Not Jesus. A lot of people don't take this seriously. But it's one of the biggest reasons why that statistic we've talked about many times, 75% of young people leave the church between the ages of 18 and 23. And you know what? We've seen it here in this church. We've seen it in other churches. That statistic stays pretty solid. I've seen it as low as 60%, as high as 80%. But it's pretty solid. If we don't take it seriously and teach our kids that this Bible is true, cover to cover, we're looking at continuing those statistics. Now, I hope this has been beneficial to you tonight. I know we, we covered a, a lot of things. We went in a lot of different directions. And uh, like I said, all those topics uh, in in CSI, this is my commercial for the CSI class. We, we cover these things um, uh, on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock in the West Wing. And, um, and, and some, some of them we go into a whole lot of detail. Uh, but you're welcome to it. Um, come on in. I don't want to take anything away from Jacob's class because I love your class, Jacob. Because your wife, not only is the class good, but your wife... <laughs> provides some of the greatest goodies and all we have down there is donuts so but anyway uh, let's have a word of prayer father we're so thankful for the truth of your word that we can rest on the, on what you've given us that we can that we can believe cover to cover what you've given us uh, in the bible father we uh, we pray for those that go out soul winning we pray for those that are teaching kids uh, father and those that are discipling others, Father, that, uh, that they would have the words to say, that, the, that those that they would understand uh, about the, the importance of the creation evolution debate, Father. Father, tonight we also uh, lift up our pastor. We, we pray for him uh, as he's uh, going to be heading back. We're, we're thankful that uh, he was able to get away. Uh, we, uh, we thank you for him, and we, uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn your hymnal to number 68. Number 68, after this song, you are dismissed. We look forward to seeing you at Thursday night soul winning and or prayer and outreach on Sunday, Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. And don't forget to be here in your Sunday school class at, on Sunday morning at 945. Number 68, we'll sing the first and last of Face to Face.
Thank you. You are dismissed. If you can stay for prayer, please do so. Thank you.